I want to welcome everyone to this uh, presentation about Victor Emanuel Nature Tourp's partnership with Aurora Expeditions. We're delighted to be working with this fine company that has excellent ships, and we're also particularly happy with the quality of the crew they have, their lecturers, and their own leaders on the ship, and how well they treat everyone who works for them. That's very important to Vent. That's the way we feel every company should be and the way we treat our employees and our staff. And I want to introduce right now, Lisa Bertini, who is the sales director for North America for Aurora Expeditions that we are delighted to be working with. Thank you, Victor. Um, nice to meet everybody virtually. My name is Lisa Bertini and I am the sales director for North America and um, a little bit about myself, I've been in the travel industry for 25 years now, mostly focused on small ship cruising and the expedition sector. And I think one of the best parts of my job is to meet travel consultants and partners all over the world. And one of them being Barry and Victor, who I met in my former role at Zagram Expeditions. So when I started Aurora, January, 2020, they were one of the first partners I um, called to tell about my new role because I really felt that the Aurora philosophy matched theirs. Um, small ship expedition focused attention on each and every guest and learning and exploration along the way. So I couldn't be happier that we are offering five trips for 2022. So let's talk a little bit about what Aurora Expeditions is. So we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, the company was actually started in 1991. So we are celebrating our 30th birthday this year. It was started back in with um, Greg and Margaret Mortimer. Greg Mortimer is a famed mountaineer and one of the first Australians to successfully climb Mount Everest without supplemental oxygen. So that kind of just gives you a little insight to he is a true adventurer. And after he and his wife, Margaret, sailed together to Antarctica and they witnessed the astonishing beauty of the continent, they knew that they wanted to start a company to share magic with others. And so Aurora Expeditions was formed and the core value of that was specifically changing people's life with close contacts to the world's great wilderness and wildlife, which we've been doing, as I mentioned, for 30 years. Along the way, you can see we've had achieved a lot of firsts and a lot of people in North America have never heard of Aurora Expeditions. They're surprised to hear that this company has been around for 30 years. And that is because they are based in Sydney, Australia, and for the last 30 years have been servicing mostly Australians and Europeans, but um, the brand has gotten out and now we are bringing a lot of US and Canadians on board. So let's talk a little bit about the ships. We have two brand new purpose-built expedition ships and with an average um, capacity of 132 passengers, we operate some of the smallest new expedition ships in the market. They're small enough to get into those nooks and crannies and um, with a one to eight expedition team to passenger ratio, um, there's more time to ask questions and get that individual one-on-one -on -one attention. The Greg Mortimer on the left there was launched last year and actually was the first passenger ship equipped with the unique Ulstein X bow. It's that funny looking, um, looks like almost an iron that you would use on your clothes. And you'll see that popping up more and more in the expedition sector, but we were the first to bring it to the passenger ship. What it does is it cuts through the swells and reduces the feelings of vibrations, and it also reduces fuel consumption. Our Sylvia Earl on the right 
is named after the renowned marine biologist, oceanographer, Dr. Sylvia Earle. What I love about her story is that she was the first female NASA scientist back in the 60s. We have named each of the decks on board the Sylvia Earle after seven global female ocean, ocean conservationists. And um, she's going to be a sister ship and launch in the, um, probably in May of 2022. Both of our ships offer a Citizens of Science project, which we are going to be focusing on whales, seabirds, microplastics, weather patterns, phytoplankton, polar fjords, and marine bio biodiversity. So we've chosen seven dynamic projects that are actually being worked on right now. And we're going to be gathering um, data for these groundbreaking global uh, works of science. The ships themselves are beautifully appointed. We truly believe that it's a great place to come back to after exploring, but our focus is on the destinations that we visit. So these ships allow us to get into those small nooks and crannies, but you still get to return to um, beautiful cabins and great lecture hall and delicious food. So people often ask, okay, Lisa, what makes Aurora Expeditions different? And I kind of say that's really three things. One, it's our 30 year history, because when you travel to these remote areas, you want to have a company that has the experience, they've been there, they have an expedition team and leader that knows how to get into those small places if Mother Nature changes their minds to always bring out the best of wherever they're at and the location and to find those unique, um, memorable moments. Secondly, we are Australia based, and that means that most of our or some of our E team are all from the Australia and that that flavor, that warm and welcoming and um, embracing spirit lives on board and it makes a very approachable crew and it also makes every single person feel right at home and um, full of attention. And that's what is really exciting about our partnership with Vent is that we are bringing on Vent leaders into our crew um, for each of these five departures. And then I think the third is that we have purpose-built ships. I love this picture on the right because it shows on the Greg Mortimer something that was designed where these flaps come down when you're when we're um, in remote areas. And you can actually go out and look over these flows of glaciers and actually be down almost eye to eye with the wildlife. I can't wait to actually experience that. The third is, I've kind of mentioned, but it's our expedition team. Oops, let's go to the fourth one, get Barry. Yeah, let's go to the next one. Oh, sorry, there we are. There we go. Like I said, we have a fantastic expedition team. And as Victor mentioned, um, our crew and our uh, staff are one of the most important assets that we have. And although our team can choose to work for different suppliers, most of our E-team have saved themselves every year for Aurora. And so what that means is that you have accredited, knowledgeable, and experienced team members that have worked together as a team for over the past 10 years. So we couldn't be more proud of this. And then I'll just end a little bit about Aurora's deep core value of sustainability. As you can tell just by, you know, the conservation, the choosing the name of each of our ships, we are committed to the conservation of in the environment. And what I like about Aurora is that we just don't use it as a marketing spiel. We're actually taking real actions for the care of our planet. I mentioned before about um, choosing the seven uh, programs for our citizens of science. We're also doing other things with goals. We just became 100% carbon neutral. And you can see that we are also having improving supply chains. 
sustainable food program and a B Corp certification on the books for 2023. You can read more about that on our website, but it's just worth mentioning that this is part of who we are. So enough of Aurora, I'm gonna pass the baton now to Barry who will start showing, telling you about the five exciting trips that we have planned for 2022. Well, thank you, Lisa. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are delighted to be embarking on this new relationship with Aurora Expeditions and our relationship will kick off in 2022 with five trips, uh, as Lisa just uh, stated. Uh, we have three trips that will be going uh, in the North Atlantic, uh, operating in May and June next year. Ireland's West Coast, Wild Scotland, and Scotland, Faroes, Jan Mayen, and Svalbard. These trips, uh, they, form a, they form a trio, if you will, in which a person could take uh, these trips either individually or take multiple, take them in, uh, in succession. After that, toward the end of the year, we have added not one, but two additional trips to Antarctica. Uh, for each of the next two years, uh, our scheduled Antarctica trips have uh, been sold out for quite some time. And so we have elected to add two more trips, both of which will be with Aurora Expeditions. And I might add that all of these trips will be aboard the Greg Mortimer, which Lisa profiled uh, a short while ago. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go through these trips, um, give you an overview of each and, uh, you know, delighted to show you what's on deck here. The very first one will be Ireland's West Coast that will operate May 12th through 26, 2022. And what we liked about this trip is that it offers a complete circumnavigation of Ireland. Uh, this map uh, is effective in that it shows it's a shows a close up of Ireland and the UK. Um, most trips to these waters go up the eastern side of Ireland. It is quite rare actually to be able to join a trip that goes around the entire country. And this trip, uh, in addition to the next two that we will that we will describe, uh, it offer they offer something for everybody. Yes, they are birding trips, uh, absolutely. Yes, they are natural history experiences, but there, this part of the world is so rich in history and culture, um, architecture. And so we think that there is something for everybody. They are ideal for the dedicated birder, uh, as well as those that travel with non-birding spouses or partners. Um, and of course, Ireland being Ireland, this is a trip that that uh, that features a lot of nice scenery. Uh, for example, towering sea cliffs, lakes, uh, bays, harbors, uh, moorlands, places like the Skelling Islands, which offer dramatic rocky islet scenery uh, and home to blizzards of nesting seabirds. Uh, things like uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. I have some uh, some bird shots to show you. But again, this wild, dramatic scenery is sort of quintessential Ireland. Uh, this f features like the, the, the so-called giant staircase, which shows uh, dramatic volcanic uh, rockscapes and so on. In Ireland, uh, we will be birding from the ship, we will be birding by Zodiac, and we will also be getting off the ship on shore for land birding. This is a nice representation of some of the, of some of the things that you can expect to see, northern gannets, black-leg kittiwakes, razorbills, Atlantic puffins, herring gulls, and more. Ireland's west coast. This trip will be led by vent tour leader David Escanio, David is, of course, a, a popular and personable and charismatic guy. Uh, most of our travelers know him as a tour leader in South America, but David has led, uh, has been, has guided in the North Atlantic region before. Uh, he's very excited about this trip. Uh, cabins begin at $12,395. We still have five cabins available. Uh, there's a couple of, I have a couple of uh, enticements to, to communicate here. One, 
is that there is a, if you go ahead and register now, there is a 25% early booking discount available on select cabins. So that's, uh, that's quite a deal. But additionally, sort of a hot off the press item, we have recently learned that single, single travelers can join without paying the single supplement, which is quite a nice deal. Um, from Ireland's West Coast, we go on to Wild Scotland. Hi, I'm Victor Emanuel, and that was our Chief Operating Officer, Barry Lyon, that you heard talking about Ireland. And I'm going to talk about Scotland because I've done this trip before. It was one of my favorite trips that I've ever done. You fly into Edinburgh and then you go up to Aberdeen and get on the ship and go around the northern side of Scotland. And as you know, Scotland is filled with fascinating history. It at one point was its own country and then England got it to uh, captured it and combined it to create Great Britain. And uh, so this fascinating history going back to the first people that settled there and built little rock houses, which are still available to see some of the first settlement in Scotland. So it's got beautiful, as it says here, beautiful seascapes. It actually also has a distinction of being where the whole study of geology began. It was a, a man who started noticing that there were rocks of different ages and rock formations and developed the whole concept of geology, which really, in a way, laid the groundwork for Charles Darwin's work. Charles Darwin was very fond of his work, and it laid the groundwork for Charles Darwin's work on the history of the world and evolution. Uh, and so it's got these beautiful cliffs. It's got wonderful birds, uh, skuas and seabirds and gulls. And it goes up to uh, all the way up to the Shetlands and around the Fair Isle, where there are migrating birds that sometimes stop there. Uh, you never know, like on any trip, the one of the wonderful things about birding, you never know what you're going to see. Uh, some rare bird, some whale uh, right near the boat, uh, some other sea animal. Mm -hmm. And uh, notice that the, the trip goes right by St. Kilda. And St. Kilda is the most isolated of all the British islands. And it also has the largest northern Gannet colony in the world. And often, and I've been there on the trip I did, there are thousands and thousands of Gannets just flying around over the colony, just hanging out together. It's a marvelous sight that very few people ever get to see. And uh, so I highly recommend the trip to Scotland. Obviously, people that want to come early can spend time in Edinburgh or in London and then join the trip. Uh, but it is a, a wonderful, wonderful trip. Okay. And I should mention that I believe there's only right now one cabin available on the trip. And uh, we might have some other cabins open up. Mm -hmm. But uh, so if you're interested, and remember, you have this uh, wonderful offer now of not paying a single supplement, let us know. Because if we get additional cabins or cabins open up, we'll have your name on the list. Exactly, Victor. And uh, also to give, to give people a preview of what they might see on the Scotland trip, uh, you'll go to places like Staffa in the Inner Hebrides to see birds like shags and northern fulmars. Um, beautiful North Atlantic scenery. And of course, a number of birds. Uh, Land birds like northern wheat ears and Eurasian wrens and seabirds alike. Uh, Victor mentioned the gannet colonies, but it's also a place to see birds like Eurasian oyster catchers and Manx shearwaters. And of course, the endearing Atlantic puffin, which uh, is uh, certainly sort of the iconic bird of the North Atlantic Ocean. Uh, Victor mentioned going through the Shetland Islands and on the way back, you will go through the the Orkney Islands as well, they are included in the program. And for people especially interested in history and culture, going to places like Kirkwall, the island capital, uh, visiting sites like the Ring of Brodgar, uh, which uh, are reminiscent of what you might see at Stonehenge. And of course, you know, you can't get enough of the puffins. Wild Scotland. Well, as I said, that's the trip and to be led by Brian Gibbons, one of our most popular leaders who went to our summer camp years ago in Arizona. That's when I met him. And uh, he has done numbers of trips in Europe, particularly in Spain, where he leads our Spain trip. And uh, knows again, one space available, 20% early booking discount. 
And as Barry said, no charge for a single supplement or a single traveler can have a room without having to pay an extra fee. Uh, we may be able to add some cabins. So uh, take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, I did this trip and I loved it. Absolutely. And for this trip and all the others, if you have questions or are interested in registering, you see the contact information there at the bottom of the screen for our colleagues, Greg Lopez and Patrick Swaggerty, who uh, are available via email or by phone call. Um, from Wild Scotland, the third of these North Atlantic departures is our trip from Scotland to Svalbard with stops in the Faroe Islands and Jan Mayen. Well, this again covers a wonderful section of the North Atlantic. And you start the trip again in Scotland. And again, you can combine it with the trip we just talked about, the Scotland trip, and goes north all the way to Svalbard, which is one of the last places in the world you can have a, a good chance of seeing a, a polar bear and also possibly ivory gulls, one of the most beautiful gulls in the world. But the Faroe Islands are very famous too for migrating birds that stop there, the Orkney Islands, Barry mentioned earlier, and then the John Mayan Island. And uh, again, great scenery, great birds, and great history. Again, uh, the, the, the start of this cruise route retraces what you would have done if you were also on the previous trip to Scotland. Uh, otherwise, you'll be seeing the Orkney Islands, Kirkwall, um, and in Kirkwall, a stop at the famous St. Magnus Cathedral. Birds, uh, this is representative of the landscapes uh, of the British, the Northern British Isles. Uh, some of the birds that you might get to see, great skuas, common eiders, European shags. Uh, here is a sampling of the scenery, um, you know, beautiful waterfall plunging off of a cliff here. Uh, again, this is just representative, but the Faroe Islands are a, a seldom visited, but uh, extremely beautiful destination. It'll be a privilege to stop there. And of course, Jan Mayen, lonely Jan Mayen, which is even more remote than the Faroe Islands, dominated by the, it's a volcanic island, dominated especially by the Beerenberg volcano. But what many people don't know about Jan Mayen is that also about half the island is reserved as a World Heritage Site and is, and is dedicated strictly for the protection of, of nesting birds. Getting to Svalbard, of course, uh, Victor mentioned polar bears, but the you know other uh, tremendous wildlife, Arctic foxes, birds like dovekeys and red phalaropes and king eiders. There's our friend, the polar bear, always, uh, always uh, a must see for people going to uh, Spitsbergen. Walrus, uh, right up there with the polar bear on most people's want list. Well, as I said, that uh, this trip is a great, great trip. And it's being read by one of our most popular tour leaders who grew up in Britain, now lives in Brazil, Andrew Whitaker. And uh, he, this trip is sold out. But again, more cabins may open up. And uh, this, again, you can get to go it without a single supplement if you want to go on the trip. Mm -hmm. And uh, Andrew is, uh, people love him. They love him as a leader, his enthusiasm, his attention to detail, his knowledge. Uh, and uh, if you don't aren't able to get on the trip next year, we will be doing it again in future years. So that's true of all of these trips. Yeah. And it's possible this could open up on this departure as well. And I just wanted to add, Victor and Barry, this is Lisa again, mm -hmm. that we are going to have on our Aurora staff a historian named Carol Knott, who has been a guest favorite for years with Aurora as well as a geologist, Dr. Uliana Hordolsky. So they're going to be on these trips as well as um, your guests so that people get a real, real well-rounded historical and um, wildlife experience. Well, thank you, Lisa. Um, you know, an outstanding trip sounds like it's gonna be even better with the addition of uh, the staff. Okay, so, from the North Atlantic to the far South Atlantic, uh, again, we will be offering two additional cruises uh, to Antarctica, the Antarctic region, 
at, in late 2022 and 2023. Um, so the Falklands, South Georgia, and Antarctic Peninsula trip is, uh, is, is th this trip parallels the main program that we're going to be operating uh, in January and one that has been sold out. And as we talk about our Antarctica programming isn't just about Antarctica. Our trips also include the, the South Atlantic outposts of the Falkland Islands and South Georgia Island. And the reason for that is that those places is where most of the wildlife is actually found. Antarctica is the peninsula. It's spectacular. It's beautiful. There are very special things to see there. But the, the, the entire experience is greatly accentuated by being able to visit the Falklands and South Georgia. And so um, the first of these trips is going, the first of these two additional trips will operate November 26th through December 18th, 2022. Um, we have already sold a number of cabins, but there are still cabins available. And just as I've highlighted here uh, with these bullet points, uh, trying to sum up Antarctica, well, it's difficult to do in bullet points. It's a bigger than life experience. And uh, however, it is about the birds and the wildlife. We expect to see, hope to see seven species of penguins. If we're lucky, we might see the emperor penguin, uh, six types of albatross, uh, excellent marine mammals, including whales, dolphins, elephant seals, and fur seals. And this trip being a little on the earlier side, uh, we have an especially good chance of seeing the male elephant seals still on the beaches. Um, and I would add that that is an excellent time of year to be going to Antarctica. The penguins are uh, setting on their eggs. Some of the eggs are hatching. You're seeing mm -hmm. young penguins. Um, it's the weather is usually us, us, good at that time of year. Sea conditions can vary from crossing to crossing. Some of them can be rather mild, some can be rougher, but uh, an advantage of the Greg Mortimer is the construction with that prowl sticking out is going to reduce the rolling of the ship. And we're very glad to be offering this trip. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, what we emphasize is that, you know, yes, Antarctica, the, the birds and the birding is incredible. Uh, no question. The seabirds, the penguins, the albatross, However, that, with that being said, Antarctica should not be viewed as a birding trip. It is a complete all around natural history experience. And it, and it overwhelms, and I mean that in a good way, it overwhelms in every, in every way imaginable. Um, and in addition to the event leaders on this trip, of course, these trips are staffed with experts in history, for people who, who know history, geology, uh, biology, other, ask other disciplines of history and natural history that together serve to give you uh, to an enhanced experience. And what the experience of the history is, of course, most famous for the Shackleton trip, where he went down and tried to cross the South Pole mm -hmm. and didn't make it and had to come back uh, on a small boat to go to South Georgia. It's quite a a uh, very exciting and moving story to hear about Shackleton and the other explorers. It was probably the last part of the globe that got explored. And it was seen at a distance by the great Captain Cook, but he didn't get to go actually down this to Antarctica, but he was almost down to Antarctica. And he did, South Georgia was claimed by the British and uh, is, is a island run by the British. and. One of the things that's wonderful at South Georgia, and that's where the, the nesting petrels and, and uh, seabirds, including the wonderful albatross nesting there, is that recently, with a max, huge effort, they've gotten rid of all invasive species, mm -hmm. including the rats. And that's caused the number of birds to increase on South Georgia. Uh, Gold Harbor at South Georgia, which I think will be a picture later, uh, Peter Harrison, who wrote the Seabirds of the World book, it's his favorite place in the world. Yeah, exactly. And um, I do want to point out, I'm flipping back to the map uh, slide here because uh, I, I want to say something about the route because it's relevant to when we profile the next Antarctica cruise. This trip starts and ends in Ushuaia, uh, southernmost um, 
uh, town or city in Argentina, in the world. Uh, in the world. Uh, we will go from there to the Falkland Islands, then to South Georgia, where we will have four full days, and then down to the Antarctic Peninsula. And the, the route is never exactly determined until just before, but between the South Shetland Islands and the Antarctic Peninsula, uh, you will spend a number of days there before coming back across the Drake Passage to Ushuaia. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to I'm going to go through some slides just to impart um, you know a, a, a sense of of intimacy about what Antarctica is like, and a lot of that is because you get so close to things. And, and let me add on, on about Antarctica. When I went for the first time. I would never have thought that one of my favorite things on the whole trip were the icebergs. Mm -hmm. I had never seen an iceberg before. Each one had a different shape. Some had penguins on them that dove into the water from the penguin. Their, their color of the iceberg varied depending on the sun direction. And I took so many pictures of icebergs that I told people on the trip, I'm not going to photograph another iceberg. <laughs> and then there was another iceberg and I grabbed my camera to get a photograph of the iceberg. So it's odd to think you go on a trip just to see icebergs, but I can tell you that they are an amazing highlight. Yes, they are. My first, uh, my first trip to Antarctica, the first expedition was a trip that I made with Victor in 2005. And uh, I was not prepared for just the, the immensity, the grandeur of the ice as Victor was talking about. But scenes like this, uh, a parade of penguins going down the beach, king penguins. Here's another amazing shot of uh, adults and young birds alike. Uh, you're able to just walk right up to the colonies, the edge of the colony. Crab eater seals, leopard seal, uh, always a big, a big draw, a big deal for people. Um, everybody wants to see a leopard seal and we should not have an issue with that. Here is Gold Harbor, um, spectacular scenery, spectacular lighting, and just the idea of getting off onto a, a, a remote beach in the company of tens of thousands of king penguins. Uh, it's a spectacle like no other. And at the top of these cliffs you're seeing to the right, there are nesting light mantle city albatross, which I consider one of the most spectacular and beautiful birds in the world. And they're flying around that you see them looking up at the cliffs and uh, they're quite amazing. Triple A. And right up there with the king penguins, the opportunity to see wandering albatross at close range. Uh, some trips are fortunate to get to see these birds uh, on their nests and displaying. Um, this is again, this is in the South Georgia area. But uh, yeah, the, the amazing wandering albatross, the world's largest albatross. And they follow the ships, these seabirds, and many of them follow the ships. And so one of the fun and exciting things to do is to go to the back of the ship and just watch what's following the ship, the different petrels and albatross mm -hmm. and other yep. birds. And as we've talked about, Antarctica is about ice. And the ice appears in limitless shapes and sizes and even colors. Uh, you've got these tall tabular icebergs, these massive building-like icebergs as uh, depicted on the left. And on the right, you get these beautiful wave sculpted things, ice that's been in the water and just transformed into a true sculpture by the water. Here's another example. This is a massive berg broken off the continental ice shelf and, and the water, the wave, the wave action erodes it out into fantastic tunnels and bridges and arches and so on. Off the ship, uh, you will be on land, but you will also be zodiacing. And in this case, as these people are doing, this is, uh, this is part of the Antarctic experience is to be motoring around ice in the water right up to the face of a glacier. It's, it's uh, almost indescribable. And ice can be calving. Ice mm -hmm. is going to be falling off into the water right there. You see it happen. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the uh, Antarctica is, is famous for its sunsets where you get these beautiful skies stained 
purple and orange and pink and the reflections on the snow. Uh, it is it is just tremendous. Um, more images of Antarctic penguins, like these Gentoo penguins moving over the rocks. Um, and a bird called the snowy sheath bill, a peculiar chicken like bird um, that is a they are a scavenger. They are both scavenger and predator and they become like familiar friends on each of our each of our landings. The Falklands, South Georgia and Antarctic Peninsula will operate November 26th through December 18th with uh, me, Barry Lyon, yours truly. And uh, we have uh, we still have space available on this trip. This price that you see here, uh, starting price at 24,071 is based in uh, balcony C stateroom uh, occupancy, meaning that this is the this is the category uh, starting price on the categories that we have for sale uh, or available to us rather. Um, this price does reflect a 15% early booking discount. However, other cabin categories are available uh, along with various prices and some with discounts. Um, as always, Greg Lopez or Patrick Swaggerty on our side is uh, are the the people to get in touch with if you'd like more information or to register. Finally, um, we are offering another one, and this is the newest uh, addition to our lineup of cruises with Aurora. This is the this is what we call the South Georgia and Antarctic Odyssey, also aboard the Greg Mortimer. This trip will operate uh, December 26th, uh, 2022 to January 17th, 2023. This trip is very similar to the trip that we just described. The main difference is that instead of starting in Ushuaia and getting on this ship and being at sea for two days and route to the Falkland Islands, uh, participants on this departure will start by flying to Santiago, Chile, and then from Santiago, you will take a flight out to the Falkland Islands where the ship will be waiting. From there, uh, it is essentially identical and the experiences uh, will be no different. Um, again, I'd like to add that on all of our Antarctica trips, we offer pre and often pre and post trips only available to vent passengers. For example, if the trip starts where we fly into Buenos Aires, there's wonderful birding and scenery around Buenos Aires. We offer a pre-trip there. You fly into Santiago, just right above Santiago, you can see condors. You can see other birds of the high Andes, just an hour or two above Santiago. And we offer that as a, a pre-trip before you leave Santiago. And then we offer as a, a post-trip, uh, I'm sorry, we also offer a pre-trip a little, little extra birding around uh, uh, the, the uh, before you get on the boat mm -hmm. around Ushuaia. And uh, so we offer more than just what you're going to see on the cruise. And I just want to add that my dear friend, Roger Tory Peterson, who was one of my closest friends and uh, almost like a second father to me, he was the most famous bird watcher and birder uh, since Audubon and did the first field guide on the birds of North America. Antarctica became his favorite destination. I don't know if he went 20 times or 30 times. I don't remember, but he would like going back and back to Antarctica. And once, and I, I wondered why that was until I went there myself and I understood why he fell in love with Antarctica. And now I've been about six or seven times. And I talk to people about it. People often say to me so many trips and so little time. The trip, one of the trips I think, if at all possible, you should do in your lifetime is Antarctica. One of the greatest places in the world for scenery, for birds, for mammals, for history. And so try to go on one of these trips. This trip will be led by Rick Wright. Rick lives uh, in New Jersey, but has led tours in many areas uh, all over the U.S., in Europe. Uh, he's got a trip to South Africa planned next year. And we're excited, and I know Rick is too, to be going to Antarctica next year. Here again, we are in um, uh, Balcony C. Our, 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 our prices start in Balcony C stateroom occupancy. Um, 
And so this trip will be limited to 16 people. And Lisa? Yes. Wow. Even though they're my own trips, I still just, I, I just love hearing about travel. But with travel these days, there's a lot of questions about the health and safety. So I just want to um, let everyone know what Aurora's uh, health and safety program is. We have um, obviously have always cared about our, the health and safety of our passengers and our crew. But with the pandemic, of course, we it's been strengthened and making sure that we're doing every single thing possible to make a safe voyage for everyone. We do have a policy now that includes mandatory vaccinations prior to embarking for all of our guests, crew, and expedition team members. We've put in the highest level of pre-cruising preventative measures the capability for PCR testing on board. In fact, our Greg Mortimer will have two PCR testing machines on board. Um, so that's available if required, as well as a robust response plan and protocols designed to bring peace of mind to all of our guests. Our vessels um, are brand new, and so their ultra modern systems include 100% fresh air recirculation in every cabin for guests and crew. And of course, like everyone, we've enhanced our cleaning and sanitation procedures on board. Our ships are both equipped with a medical center with facilities for emergency care, including a doctor and nurse with current training in the public health protocols, outbreak prevention and management protocols. So we are putting things in place as a, a prevention, but that being said, it certainly is really exciting to me to be looking forward to the future and um, of travel. And before uh, we, we we open it to questions and answers, because I know that uh, Victor and Barry are very humble, I would just like to celebrate Vince's 45th anniversary coming up uh, this year. I just think that's, despite everything that's going on in the world, that you've had uh, such a great and strong organization for the past 45 years. I just like to celebrate that. So thank you. Thank you very much for mentioning that Lisa. We are very excited. It's going to start this Sunday night in South Texas with McAllen. We have 115 people attending. So should we open it up to questions and answers now? Sure. Right. So if anybody has a question, uh, please enter that into the Q&A section in your control panel. Uh, we have a question here from Carol. She wants to know when you might have the 23-24 Antarctica <laughs> schedule. Uh, Lisa, did you get that question? I did, and I just wanted to make sure I was invited to answer that question. Yes. Yes, um, Aurora is actually coming out with our Antarctica 23-24 schedule um, early next year, early 2022. And uh, I can share some of what we're planning as far as dates and the length of trips with Barry and Victor and Greg. So Carol, um, if you want to talk to Greg one-on-one, -on -one, even though we don't have the brochure or the trips posted, you can at least get an idea of when those dates are. And let me add that my, it, my uh, guess is that the Yates will be very similar. We go to Antarctica in from, uh, as I say, late November through January is when our trips are. We don't usually go in February. The penguins aren't, you know, are starting to, to uh, not as good. And uh, so every year we're doing them at about the same time of year, but soon, as Lisa said, we'll have the exact dates. And so if you would send an email to us, we'll make sure you to get notified and you can send an email to our site, uh, Victor Emanuel Nature Tours, uh, and you'll be one of the first people to find out about the exact dates and any discounts that are being offered and so forth. Uh, there's a question from Sharif, uh, wondering if vent participants will be birding from kayaks. 
<laughs> will we be will event participants be birding from kayaks? Uh, well, there's there's a couple of different ways to answer this question. Um, among the many activities that Aurora offers on their expedition, on selectively, uh, I would imagine, is the opportunity to to do some kayaking. Um, from the standpoint of an event tour group organizing a kayaking outing to go birding, the answer is probably not. Uh, that is not something that is likely to occur. Uh, there will be birding certainly by other means uh, from the Zodiac, from the ship, from the shore, but not from kayaking. However, uh, just because we have event tour group on board does not mean that people can't also enjoy other activities presented by Aurora. And if they want to take their kayak out with their binoculars, you can do so. We have a question here from Denise. Uh, what is the weather like during these periods of the year? And what can you say about seasickness? Well, the weather in Antarctica, like many, many places, varies from day to day. You can have uh, very cold conditions. You could have some snow and ice. You could have a a sleet storm, but you can also have beautiful weather, very sunny. I've actually, on some of the trips I made, I was dressed in just a normal shirt, not even a jacket on, on the deck of the ship, having a party in the back of the ship and uh, people dancing and having fun hearing music and dancing on the back of the ship. So it can vary a lot, but in general, the weather is going to be in the high 30s, high, in the 30s and low 40s. And of course, with wind, that's going to make it. So it's not going to be as cold as it would be to be in some parts of the United States in the winter. It's going to be relatively, you know, not terribly mm -hmm. if you dress for it. And the key is to dress with a proper clothing, uh, which uh, all of us did. And uh, it's, it's uh, as I say, it varies from the, as far as sea conditions. Again, uh, it can be very rough. But again, I highly recommend for those that are prone to seasickness, there are medications you can take. Uh, the when you when you when the crew has advised you that the rough seas are coming, you take those medications before you get into rough seas, and they work very well. And uh, I have numbers of friends who have taken the trip, and clients who have taken the trip, and even though they're prone to seasickness, they were fine. Um, there are other times when the sea is remarkably mm -hmm. calm. Mm -hmm. And the last voyage of the trip is crossing the Drake Passage, which is the water between Antarctica and South America. And it's where ships went around the world there before the Panama Canal was built. There have been times when people have jokingly called it the Drake Lake. It was so calm that it, it wasn't all what they expected. Um, there are three or four major crossings. Some of them can be rough. Some, if you're lucky, they can all be relatively calm. But again, you can prepare for it, and it's worth making the effort. Yeah. I wanted to just respond. I believe it was Carol who was asking about um, 2324. And we have a vent partnership trip planned for January 19th. 2024 to South Georgia and the Antarctic Odyssey. So it's including South Georgia, the Falklands, and then it does have that air on part of the Drake passing. So there's only um, the, the Drake Lake or the Shake Lake, whatever you want to call it, is only happening once on that and you actually fly one way. But that date is January 19th, embarkation 2024. And we have um, an agreement, but just nothing's been promoted yet because of the assets not being available. Thanks. We have a question here from Jim uh, about COVID. Uh, I'll direct this to you to start, uh, Barry. Uh, do you have a COVID antigen test during the voyage? And if you do, what do you do if a passenger turns positive? This happened on a member of our group during circumnavigation of Iceland. Via contact tracing, 19 people flew back to the U.S. halfway in one week in a one-week cruise. Um, well, you know, this is some. You know, every 
the procedures when we partner with a with a company on a cruise, the procedures that are in place uh, regarding any aspect of the expedition are those of the cruise company, and so um, we would need we would need to know with working with Aurora Expeditions what the testing procedure would be in a worst case scenario if you had a if you had a positive uh, test result. Uh, how that would be handled and where people would be taken to. Um, and all I can, I can say is that I can, if, if you'd like, please send um, an email to uh, Ben, if you could take that email and forward that to me, I'd be happy to um, put you, uh, answer that one-on-one. -on -one. I will say that the protocols for COVID and the health and safety procedures are constantly evolving. So I can tell you what we're going to be doing next, you know, in January, 2022, but those protocols and uh, procedures could change by the time we get to May of 2022. But well, let, me, let me jump in and say that one of the, these are evolving and the virus is still a big concern and we don't want it all be casual about it. But one of the many encouraging things besides the wonderful vaccines and the modification of the vaccines to take care of, of, uh, of the changes in the virus is the drugs that people can take. They're developing now that right after you get the virus, if you're that unfortunate, they are now in the process. They're not completely finished and approved, but drugs that you could take immediately that will combat the virus. It's gonna be a major step in terms of dealing with the virus when these new drugs get approved. Well, from our question and answer section, we don't have any more live questions. So anything else that you would like to say for your closing remarks? Well, I'd like to say if you, after hearing about this, you have any other questions, you can contact Victor Emanuel Nature Tours and we will be happy to answer it. And uh, my closing remarks, again, is take advantage of these opportunities. If at all possible, go to Antarctica. It will be the greatest trip of your life. Yeah. Yes. And I just want to uh, uh, second that and also to thank Lisa for um, her role in, in facilitating this new partnership. We are very discerning with who we agree to work on on these types of trips. Um, you know, uh, our, our own commitment to quality is such that we are not uh, inclined to, to be willing to risk that or compromise that. And so by partnering with a trusted organization, we feel that we have the credibility of both Vent and the partnership, uh, the partner organization that we're working with. And in this case, it is Aurora Expeditions. And I also want to, uh, I, I, I want to finish also by, by uh, echoing what Victor just said a moment ago. I mean, obviously, in this time, travel of any kind is still a is still a, a significant concern for many people, understandably so. Um, we are doing everything we can on our tours to to operate them as safely as we can, and to make sure that we have that we are in touch with all the right people in the event of a worst case scenario, of uh, primarily being illness. And so, uh, as, as Lisa demonstrated, we are confident in their health and safety protocols that they have in place for each of these voyages, and uh, we're excited about each of them. The other thing I want to mention is, if you look at our YouTube channel for Victor Emanuel Nature Tours, and Ben could tell you more about how to reach it, we did a webinar that Andrew Whitaker did on Antarctica that I encourage you to watch. It's about a 45-minute or an hour webinar on our Antarctica trips that is marvelous. So in addition to what you saw today, I encourage you to look at that webinar. It's on our YouTube channel and uh, you can find that great webinar. Okay, thank you. And I would like to thank you guys for the time and the opportunity and everyone out there who's listening. So have a great rest of your day. Thank you.